Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear students, dear friends, thank you all for coming to this exceptional event. As, as you know, the annual Manchester Lecture always constitutes a highlight in the agenda of the Manchester International Centre. It is our most high profile event of the year. It is also a continuation of, of an old tradition that made Manchester very famous in the world of international law. In a moment, I will have the immense pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, uh, Excellency Judge Shua. Uh, however, before I do so, I would like to take the liberty to add a few introductory uh, observations on the Mellon Shell project and complement what my friend and colleague Ian Scobie has just said. Professor Scobie has, has recalled the genealogy of this much acclaimed lecture series. Well, Mellon Shell is not only a lecture series, it is also, as mentioned by Ian, a prestigious series of research monographs on international law published by Manchester University Press, and Manchester University Press is, is pres present today. Um, originally, the, the, the book series and the le lecture series were, were intertwined, each of the original lectures leading to a major monograph. Nowadays, the, the Mellon Shield Studies in International Law Institute a standalone book series that comes numerous classics of international law. Ian and myself have initiated a range of new projects uh, around the Mellon Shield Studies in International Law, thanks to a very fruitful and pleasant collaboration with Manchester University Press, which is represented uh, uh, today, <coughs> and I want to thank them. Um, and, and I would like to flag some of these, these projects, uh, again, supplementing a little bit what, what Ian said earlier. We, we are about to republish Jenny's acquisition of territory, which, which is a classic, and it will come with a new introduction by, by Marcelo Cohen, and, and, and the book is, is ready, so, so it's, it, it will be out very soon. Also in the pipeline, you, you'll find Green's Law of Armed Conflict, uh, a new edition with, by two new authors. We will republish Tony Carty's Decade of, of International Law with a new introduction by, by Tony himself. Um, we project to, to, to republish Hilary Chasworth and Kristen Chinking, The Boundaries of International Law with Feminist Analysis, and the authors have accepted to, to write an introduction. Also on our list, we have Churchill's Law on Law of the Sea with a new introduction, obviously a very timely publication. Nigel White's third edition of The Law of International Organizations is on its way. And eventually, uh, we hope to soon launch a series of edited volumes entitled Perspectives on International Law. Again, all this is, is being designed uh, uh, in collaboration with, with Manchester University Press, and I would like to thank Tony Mason, who is, who is in the room today. Ladies and gentlemen, we will never know whether the lecture series, the book series, will net and all the other initiatives we, we've taken under the banner of Melvin Schill would have met the ambitions of Olive Schill when she made a request to the university. Yet what we know is that if the Melvin Schill project is thriving, it is thanks to a very vibrant community of researchers behind it. The Manchester International Centre, MILK as we call it, will count 40 members next year having established itself as one of the most vibrant research centers in international law in Europe. Our annual Mellon Schill Lecture not only celebrates a very distinguished scholar, it also pays tribute to the very inspiring community of researchers and students, and they are here today, that have made Manchester an intellectual center in the world of international law. After these introductory remarks, I now have the immense privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker, Her Excellency Judge Schur. It would obviously take me the whole night to go through the stellar and absolutely stunning resume of Judge Shua Han Chen. May Her Excellency forgive me for limiting myself to just a few of her numerous achievements. Although my account will be cursory, it will suffice for you to appreciate 
how privileged we are, we are to have such a distinguished speaker with us tonight. Judge Xu currently sits on the bench of the International Court of Justice, being a member of the court since 2010. She was, member, she was a member of the United Nations International Commission from 2001 to 2010 and chaired the commission in 2010. She's a member of the Institut de Droit International. She's a member of the Curatorium of the Hague Academy of International Law. She was president of the Asian Society of International Law. I would also like to mention that she graduated from Beijing University and also holds a LLM and a GSD from Columbia University. She has a distinguished career in diplomatic service and foreign affairs. She participated as head or members of Chinese delegations in numerous international conferences and treaty negotiations in various fields of public international law. She has been the head of some very important delegations negotiating highly sensitive issues of international law, like the status of Hong Kong and Macau. She was the ambassador to the Netherlands, uh, the ambassador of China to the Netherlands and to the Asian. Judge Xue also is a very remarkable scholar, and she has published extensively on various issues of international law. She's a professor at Wuhan University. Last but not least, let me mention that, because it ties in with the topic of today, let me mention that she delivered a course at the Hague Academy of International Law in 2011, entitled Chinese Contemporary Perspectives on International Law, a lecture which is now being published and which is a must read for any international lawyer. Judge Hsu's talk tonight is entitled Cultural Element in International Law. Needless to say that Ian Scobie and myself were extremely pleased when Judge Hsu informed us of the short a few months ago. We've always envisaged the Melon Shell Lecture Series as a platform for refreshing and thought-provoking thinking on international law. In this respect, there is no doubt that our guests focus on the cultural element to constitute an angle which has long been neglected by international legal scholars. Probably since the Enlightenment, international lawyers have been led to believe that international law boils down to a technical, rational tool to administer the order without which there cannot be any freedom. And this is what we call the liberal view. According to this liberal view, international law is meant to be the allegedly objective product of allegedly uh, criteria, allegedly clear and determinate criteria uh, of law attainment. Well, such a liberal view and such a deceitful view of international law has made international lawyers oblivious uh, of the fundamental cultural dimension of our doctrines and practices. Because the annual Melanchol Lecture is a platform that aspires to provide new perspectives on international law and perspectives that challenge or most ingrained assumptions. They could be, they could not be a more appropriate topic for this year's Mellon <coughs> lecture. Joshua will speak for approximately an hour, but then there will be plenty of time for discussion. Joshua values exchanges. Uh, and she will gladly engage in, in the debate with, with the audience. The event will be followed by a reception to which you are all invited. Before I pass the floor to our distinguished speaker to deliver the annual Melanchol Lecture, I would like to thank a few people with whom this celebration would not have been possible. Uh, first, Mariela Apostolaki, a PhD fellow uh, here at the University of Manchester and the executive manager of the Center. I would like to thank Barbara Dalsbeck, the Secretary of Judge Schuer at the International Court of Justice. Her help has been absolutely crucial. And finally, I would like to, to thank Wim Müller, who is with us today and whose input in the planning and organization of this event has been very valuable. Uh, and finally, uh, I would like to mention that we are joined by, by colleagues from, from other universities who have traveled uh, sometimes a long way 
to, to join us tonight, uh, James, Vasilis, Mary, and I'm missing, of course, many, many others. Uh, well, thank you so much. It's, it's a nice acknowledgement of your interest in our work and a nice acknowledgement of your, of your friendship. It is now time for me, finally, to give the floor to Her Excellency Judge Schur and invite her to deliver the annual Madam Lecture. Your Excellency, thank you so much for being with us. You have the floor. Dear colleagues, it's my great honor and a privilege to be invited to give a Manchester lecture this year at the University of Manchester. First of all, I wish to extend my warm congratulations on the great achievements the center has made under the Manchester program. I was deeply impressed by the introduction. The topic of my lecture today is cultural element in international law. The relationship between culture and the law is not a novel topic for international legal studies. Indeed, the early cultural studies movement that started from this country, Great Britain, in the mid 20th century and later spread to many other countries contributed a great deal to the interdisciplinary approach to cultural studies and enriched research areas of many academic disciplines of the social sciences and the humanities. And it's commented by one distinguished anthropologist, culture is increasingly a prized intellectual commodity, aggressively appropriated by other disciplines as an organizing principle. At the national level, legal scholars have long recognized that the events of life and the law do not exist in the abstract, but in the concrete patterns of everyday experience. In Britain, common law reflects customs and usages. In German early jurisprudence, the historical school views law as a product of nation's culture and as embedded in the daily practices of his people. In the American jurisprudence in the 1980s, the constitutive theory assumes that the law plays the role of a forming culture that's constitutive of people's minds, practices, and social relations. These legal studies, on whatever theories they are based, all recognize that law is an inseparable dimension of social relations. For the purpose of the following discussions, the notion of cultural element I have in mind primarily refers to such factors as tradition, custom, religion, gender, ethnics, language, to which law, international rules and principles and institutions may relate. I'm not going to discuss these factors per se in relation to law, but the focus on their dimension in the legal relations between states. To begin with, I wish to highlight a few general observations. First, cultural element is an increasingly important aspect for international law in a globalized world. With economic globalization and IT revolution, social connectivity among states and peoples have greatly changed the social cultural dimension of international relations. Secondly, general recognition of cultural diversity does not automatically transform it into normative and institutional principles in international law. Legal advocacy remains necessary. Thirdly, cultural element of the existing laws and the legal institutions require constant review and reflection. I shall deal with these points from both international as well as national perspectives. In international law, cultural element is often embedded in technical terms. Family laws, for example, vary greatly from state to state. This is because of such cultural uh, civil matters as marriage, parental and child relations, maintenance, to a large extent reflect local tradition and custom. 
private international in dressing conflict of laws normally gives deference to such traditions and customs. If a man with his family works and lives abroad, the validity and effect of his marriage shall be governed not by the law of the residing state, but, but by his national law or the law of the place where his marriage was registered. By recognizing his marriage, the residing state thus respects the tradition and the custom to which the man is a subject. Now, understanding such a recognition is limited by the public order of the residing state. In practice, we often encounter much more complicated situations. Supposing a state intends to send a diplomat with his same-sex partner or spouse to a country where such partnership or marriage is not recognized or valid and is full. All states wish to send a diplomat with the two wives to a country where polygamy is not accepted. There is clearly a conflict of law issue between the two countries. Beneath the conflict of laws is the cultural difference. For the receiving country, the matter may not be just about the diplomatic protocol. It could have a negative impact on the residing society. The receiving state may decline the nomination on the basis of a public order. As international lawyers, how should we advise handle such matter? If you were the legal advisor of the government of the sending state, would you advise it to insist on its nomination as a matter of human rights? Or would you advise it to approach the matter from a cultural angle? <coughs> By my experience, I can tell you, if one takes the full approach, it will most likely give rise to tension between residing and the receiving states. If it is otherwise treated as a matter of cultural differences, the states in question may be more willing and patient to listen to the specific concerns that they each have with regard to the nomination. I try to seek a proper solution that both sides feel comfortable to be with. A cultural element can be immaterial and even trivial in one context, but a highly sensitive and penetrating training in another. To analyze the issue, therefore, one has to first to understand its context. I shall take a language, for example, and give you three cases to illustrate my point. The first case is the language policy of the European Union, EU. In a European integration, member states of the European Union forming the European Community have formed common policies in a broad range of areas, political, economic, social, and financial and social. However, they are quite categorical that there is no integral union policy on culture for, the, for respect of culture diversity. Under the policy, the language is a sensitive issue. There is no common language that has to be chosen for the operation of the union. Each member uses its own national language. All the EU laws, regulations, and directives are delivered to the member states in their national languages and directly take effect at the national level. It's clear that to maintain the normal operation of the EU in over 20 different languages, the financial burdens and the technical complexity of translation are considerable. But not to do so, the potential loss of a valuable cultural heritage as represented by the national language of each member state during the integration process would equally be serious. Being an exclusive regional integration organization, <coughs> this language arrangement, good or bad, is supposed to ensure that no one language would be given superior position over any other language. As an inter inter institutional arrangement, language is linked with the cultural diversity. In contrast, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, offers a different case. 
This sub-regional organization, Adopti Sanchata, became an integrated regional organization in 2008. Respect for cultural diversity is also one of its fundamental principles. However, it decided to use English as its working language. This decision may be explained by a number of considerations. First, ASEAN has not yet reached the same level of integration as the EU does. Its policies have to be implemented through national legislation and measures. Therefore, translation can be done subsequently at a national level. Secondly, ASEAN is an inclusive rather than an exclusive sub-regional organization. It has established various kinds of partnership with the countries both from the region and outside. A commonly used working language is much more convenient and economical for communication. Lastly, technically speaking, translation among various regional, uh, na national languages of the 10 member states is just beyond the question, regardless of its financial cost. Moreover, English language does not carry the cultural implication for any particular member state. It's primarily taken as a tool of communication with ASEAN, but not perceived as a cultural element that falls under the principle of cultural diversity, as the case with the EU. That said, we should not overlook the fact that ASEAN's choice of English as its working language to a certain extent does reflect the British and the American cultural influence in the region, historically and contemporarily. And ASEAN and its member states' ties with these major powers <coughs> also obvious. Institutionally, nevertheless, the common language use does not present a sensitive policy issue to ASEAN. My third case relates to the office I'm now working for, the International Court of Justice. I shall discuss it in more detail. The ICJ being one of the six major organs of the United Nations is the only organ that uses French and English as its official languages. The rest of the UN organs use six working languages with the addition of Arabic, Chinese, Russian, and Spanish. This is because the ICJ has inherited the practice of its predecessor, the Permanent Court of International Justice, PCIJ. According to Article 92 of the UN Charter, the ICJ statute is based on the statute of the PCIJ. Paragraph 1 of Article 39 of the PCIJ statute, which provided the official languages of the court, was adopted into the ICJ statute. Considering the nature of the court's judicial work, translation between two official languages is obviously far more manageable and economical than that among six. The choice of the official language or languages was, however, not purely out of technical and pragmatic considerations. If we, we, we recall the history of the PCIJ, we can see that in the wake of World War I, when the First World Court was established, both Britain and France were the great colonial powers in the world. Although the legal nations used three working languages, French, English, and Spanish, the World Court did not follow suit. Instead, it was to operate in French and English, the languages of the two principal legal systems in the world, the European Continental Law, uh, Continental Law and the English Common Law. Technically, this bilingualism reflects the state of affairs of international legal order at that time. Language serves as a symbol of political domination. A large number of countries that were still under colonial rule or foreign domination did not fall within the category of civilized nations. Therefore, they had little role to play in the formation and the practice of international law. By adopting the provision of the PCIJ statute, the ICJ, not only by design, continues the jurisprudence and the tradition of the PCIJ, but also as a consequence maintains the cold culture that is largely shaped 
through the interaction of the two legal traditions, in the process of which language is an effective medium. In this regard, two observations can be made. First, language, albeit a tool of communication, has a restrictive effect on access to information of state practice in the field of international law. To be accessible, state practice has to be presented in either of the official languages of the court, whether in its original form or properly translated. With the 15 judges from five continents on the bench, one may argue that the judges are not restrained or should not be restrained by this linguistic barrier, as they are supposed to be representing the main forms of civilization and the principal legal systems of the world. That may be true. That representation, however, does not by itself automatically guarantee a wide access to and sufficient knowledge of state of practice. For the court as a whole, any evidence that it wishes to take account, account of must be readable and understood by all judges. State of practice, for instance, national legislation and judicial decisions of the United Kingdom are readily available for research by the court without much difficulty. Well, materials of national laws and judicial decisions of countries such as China, Russia, Indonesia, Brazil, to name a few, are hard to find in English or French. To search for state practice on an international issue, what is decisive is often dictated by what is generally available in popular languages for study. Those that are not accessible in the two official languages may seldom come to the attention of researchers. Second, bilingualism facilitates the shaping of the court culture in a number of aspects. The two principal legal systems, civil law and the common law, have much influence on the practice of the court, both procedurally and substantively. By analogy, general rules and principles as practiced in these systems have gradually found their way into the practice and jurisprudence of the court. For example, the doctrine of estoppel, res judicata, good faith, essential parties rule, act of state doctrine, etc. Well, borrowed from either of the legal systems, it's not surprising that most of the counsels that appear before the court on behalf of the parties come from or have been trained in these legal systems, and they not only have the best among the language skills to articulate legal arguments, but also by training, sensitive to trends in law and able to assess correctly the relative weight of a rule's many elements to make persuasive legal arguments for the court. When the parties come from different legal systems, it proves all the more important for them to employ such foreign counsels in their legal teams. They not only have to employ foreign counsels, but also have to include counsels from both legal systems both English and French speaking, if the case is adjudicated in its normal fashion. In the discussions of the court's work for reform, bilingualism is often blamed as one of the causes for excessive documentation of written proceedings and delays in the proceedings due to translation. Some scholars, however, take the view that the tradition of a bilingualism presents a certain attraction for French-speaking states. Moreover, it has the advantage of providing a control language, both during deliberation and in the drafting of orders and judgments. Apart from these technical considerations, which I agree, more important, I think, is the value of a cultural and the legal diversity that the court is supposed to possess and preserve. 
I said before to vindicate <clears throat> before the court the ability to fully appreciate the court culture and the competence to deal skillfully with the procedural and evidential details are just as crucial as the merits of the case. This brings me to another dimension of a cultural element in the judicial practice. The rules of a court initially were based on the rules of the PCIJ. They were substantially updated in 1978 and further amended subsequently. In 2001, the court adopted practice directions as a guidance for use by states appearing before the court in contentious cases. Procedural and evidential rules and the practice, nevertheless, are the area where cultural differences of different legal systems tend to emerge and even clash. I shall take the winning case for an example. Australia found an application against Japan in the court, alleging that Japan's scientific winning program, JAPA 2, had breached its obligations under the International Convention for the Regulation of the Weighing, the Weighing Convention, and its other international obligations for the preservation of the maritime mammals and the maritime environment. Australia claimed that catches of whales with the special permits issued by Japan and the JAPA 2 were over excessive. Reveal, revealing that actual purpose of JAPA 2 was for commercial building rather than scientific research. Japan, for its part, argued that its issuance of special permits to catch whales and the JAPA 2 was in conformity with Article 8, Paragraph 1 of the Whaling Convention. During the process, New Zealand intervened as a non party and Article 63 of the statute. Notwithstanding Japan's request for a second round of written pleadings, the court decided to have just one round of written, written pleadings. As to the case, was a scientific evidence intensive, experts were appointed by the parties and later were cross-examined during the oral hearings. In its judgment, the court found inter alia that the special permits granted by Japan in connection with the JAPA 2 did not fall within the provisions of Article 8, Paragraph 1 of the Wayne Convention. Therefore, Japan should revoke external to special permits in relation to JAPA 2 and refrain from granting further permits under the program concerned. During the proceedings, Japan did not conceal its sentiment of being culturally prejudiced against by the West with regard to its waiting tradition. Procedurally, it was apparently unhappy with the court decision not to have a second round of waiting pleadings and the way in which New Zealand handled its intervention as it had allegedly coordinated its position with Australia. More than that, compared with the applicant, the Japanese team look uneasy about the way in which the cross-examination of experts was conducted. After the delivery of the judgment, although Japan stated that it would respect the decision of the court, <coughs> it continued scientific weighing <coughs> activities by reducing the number of target catches for whales. On the 7th of October 2015, a year and a half after the delivery of the court's judgment in the Whaling case, Japan deposited with the Secretary General of the United Nations in its capacity as depository a declaration of its acceptance of the compulsory jurisdiction of the court and Article 36, Paragraph 2 of the statute, which in effect as one paragraph to Japan's original declaration excluding from the court jurisdiction. I quote, any dispute arising or concerning or relating to research on or conservation, management or exploitation of living resources of the sea, unquote. 
Clearly, this new resolution will prevent any further legal actions in the court against Japan for wasteful <coughs> activities. In my view, even if Japan's concerns were taken care of, it would not in any event alter the outcome of the court decision. There are, however, some cultural elements that people may overlook. They may emerge in other cases as well. First of all, waiting is a highly sensitive issue in the environmental field. Japan has long been put on the defensive in the public for its waiting activities. Against that background, Japan was very likely more sensitive to the fairness of the procedural decisions of the court. Although under the rules of a court, it's up to the court to decide whether there should be a second round of written pleadings, Japan reacted strongly to the court's decision not to have a second round in the written phase. Linguistically, it's understandable that Japan would feel much more com confident with the written arguments than oral. A second round would have provided with another opportunity to strengthen its position. However, as a respondent, Japan has had the last words during the written phase. It should have taken that into consideration before it raises a request. <laughs> Secondly, New Zealand's intervention made Japan very unhappy. Even though New Zealand intervened as a non-party under Article 63 of the statute, purportedly for the purpose of giving its own interpretation of the Wayne Convention. Because of its like-mindedness with the applicant on Wayne, its intervention reinforced Japan's impression that the case was culturally biased. <clears throat> Moreover, as the case heavily involved scientific evidence, cross-examination of experts approved <coughs> by the parties proved crucial. Although technically the examination was conducted by its foreign councils, who were skillful with the procedure, culturally Japan was apparently less familiar with the technique of cross-examination than the applicant. Because cross-examination apparently the technique was common law practice. And this may amplify Japan's skepticism towards the judicial process. Lastly, Japan's decision to exclude future legal actions on waiting from the jurisdiction of the court not just shows its reservation to the decision of the court in the waiting case, but also reveals a deep-rooted mentality towards lawsuits in Asian culture, general, that, general, that Asian culture generally share, namely, try to avoid confrontation in the courts. Well, the English saying goes, if you can't beat it, join it. Asian culture teaches us that if you can't beat it, leave it, avoid it. In Chinese, I know some Chinese students, they say, that means you can't beat it, leave it. If you can't beat it, avoid it. So that's very much a non-confrontational -conf approach that the Asian culture tends to take. Of course, Japan is not the only country that destroyed its acceptance of the court's jurisdiction after it loses its case. The waiting case nevertheless presents a good example demonstrating a clash of cultural differences in the judicial settlement of international disputes. Missing is a cultural element. One would not be able to understand why third party settlement is not a purely technical process. <clears throat> As on the international plane, cultural element equally influences the state practice of international law at the national level. In the 2011, during the summer courses of Hague Academy of International, at the end of my special call, the special lectures on Chinese 
contemporary perspective on international law, one student asked me the following question. She said, as all states should supposedly apply international law equally, how come there could be different national perspectives? This is one question I think that I need to address. And also I noticed one commentator on my Hague lecture, published in the American Journal of International Law, also noted that the lecture, my lecture, he said, did not give much discussion to the cultural aspect of Chinese international theory and the practice. So I think perhaps this uh, uh, provides, this lecture provides a good opportunity for me to address these queries. It is true that as one legal system, international law should apply in the same way to all states. That doesn't mean, however, states would take the same position on all international issues, or they would adopt the same attitude towards the legal order. Otherwise, how can we explain that the composition of the ICJ is required as a statute to represent the main forms of civilization and the principal legal systems of the world? when the judges are supposedly to serve in their individual capacity, independent of their governments. How can we explain the legal debates among states in the UN Human Rights Committee on the issue of the legality of use and threat of use of nuclear weapons, or with regard to sovereign unity of a state and its poverty in relation to war crimes? We are constantly being reminded that international law is more than a given body of rules and obligations. As is pointed out by Oscar Schachter, international law involves purposive activities undertaken by governments directed to a variety of social ends. These activities, I quote, are conditioned and limited by constraints on the voluntary choices of the government, constraints related to factors of power, resources, ideology, felt needs. Underlying these factors are the less perceptible societal conditions, especially those that mark historical transformations. In other words, in other words, states' positions on international law are affected by various factors that go <coughs> into international relations, well beyond the body of the law. For any state, is a cultural, traditional environment that often provides the social context for its legal system, likewise influences its decision on international legal issues. China's case is very special and unique. China is the largest developing country, a permanent member of the Security Council of UN, now the second largest economy in the world. And yet, the People's Republic of China was kept outside the international legal system for nearly 30 years during the Cold War period. Its legitimacy in the UN was not restored until 1971, and China did not take a full part in the work of the Sixth Committee of the, uh, the General Assembly, the Legal Committee of the General Assembly, and other UN legal, legal organs until 1978, after its internal cultural revolution was over. Today, even when China is a full-fledged participant, in the field of international law. Its action is still often perceived and portrayed as a break away from the existing legal order. Take a recent case, for example, its initiative in setting up the Asian Infra Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIMB, was at first, or maybe still, regarded as a defiance or rebellion to the existing international financial institutions, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund in particular. So it's necessary, I think, to bridge some cultural differences here. The Chinese is a peace-loving people. 
deeply rooted in its tradition and culture is the values for peace and harmony. The ancient philosophies such, such as Confucianism, Taoism, Moism, and Legalism all advocated peace. Among them, Confucianism has the most enduring influence on the Chinese society till this day. One of the essential values of Confucianism is benevolence as a guideline to the treatment of civilizations. From its inception, the government of People's Republic of China made it clear that it adhered to a foreign policy of peace, respecting the basic norms of international relations as enshrined in the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. As I discussed in a lecture, in 1954, China, together with India and Myanmar, formulated the five principles of peaceful coexistence. And which was subsequently adopted as the Bandung Ten Principles at the first Asia African Conference held in Bandung, Indonesia, in 1955. Not understanding the political changes in the Cold War and afterwards, China has ever since consistently applied these five principles in its international relations. With all states, the East and the West, the North and the South. It's well known that China ultimately advocates a full respect for the principles of sovereignty and non-interference in internal affairs. For the Chinese, the period since the first Opium War in 1840 till the founding of the new People's Republic of China was the most miserable and humiliating time in its modern history. As I point out in my Hague lecture, China was virtually deprived of all the basic attributes of a sovereign state after it became a semi-colonial state. Largely due to that 100 years historic experience, China is very sensitive to issues bearing on its sovereignty or interference in its internal affairs. Confucius Shu Dao, forgiveness, Forgiveness is often termed in the following phrase. Do not do to others what you don't want others to, to do to you. For China, it means it will not allow itself to go through the same experience again, and at the same time, it will not do the same to do, it will not do the same thing to other countries. The five principles underscore that position. I will not dwell on the idea here, as I have already given a sufficient count on the topic in a lecture. The value of benevolence in the Chinese culture is also manifested in China's full policy of good neighborliness. As the Chinese saying goes, a good neighbor is better than a distant relative. I think that is a shared by many other cultures. Let alone these neighbors will never move away. Frankly speaking, when the People's Republic of China was established, its surrounding environment was very difficult and complicated. Even when its relations with the Soviet socialist countries were very close, its land boundaries were either traditional boundary borders, actual control lines, or governed by all the treaties with unclear terms. Boundary disputes were inevitable, well greatly dictated by domestic politics. Boundary matters also involve world geopolitics. Despite some border armed conflicts in the 1960s and 1970s, step by step, China settled its boundaries with almost all its land neighbors. Its position best demonstrated its cultural pragmatism. It did not simply discard all treaties, although it considered them unequal or being imposed by the former colonial powers. Instead, it decided to negotiate the boundary matters on the basis of these treaties, with a view to seeking equitable and reasonable solutions. 
This good neighborliness policy is carried on to its relations with the Northeast and Southeast Asian countries. At the moment, there are two major issues with China that have given rise to a lot of attention in the region. One is the history issue with Japan. The other is the maritime disputes with the adjacent coastal claimant states. Currently, these disputes have directly hindered China's relations with some of its neighbors. In my opinion, the questions and issue are much more complicated than they look. In the long run, I'm quite confident that with Asian wisdom and vision, like we did with our land, land neighbors, these countries can and will ultimately sit down to negotiate with a view to finding solutions to the, their disputes. At the moment, things are not up to one side or to the countries in the region. In Chinese, we have another saying, namely, Shu Yu Jin or Feng Yuzhi. In English, it reads, the trees wish to stand still, but the wind keeps blowing. It means that stability does not depend on one side. We need patience and perseverance. As I discussed in the Hague lecture, to resolve such complicated matters as maritime disputes, the best way is to start with easy matters and gradually build up mutual confidence and trust. Little by little, we can approach the more difficult matters, pave the way for a final solution. This is what we call, well, water flows, but channel is a fall. In other words, when conditions are right, success will come. In Chinese, it means shui dao qi chen. Currently, a lot of tension has been attached to the third party settlement. As a judge, I'm not going to discuss anything particular relating to a case. But I wish to point out on a general basis that a, but, a big political decision, a choice of a means of a dispute settlement is in essence a matter of culture. That's to say what parties envisage from the mechanism, what they understand about the institution of third party settlement, how they appreciate its process and evaluate the final outcome, all much depend on their understanding of the legal culture that a dispute settlement mechanism embraces. ASEAN's dispute settlement mechanisms are generally conciliatory and consultative in nature. African Court on Human and People's Rights does not design its procedures in the same way as those of the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. The legal culture in these three continents varies greatly. It's hard to pass on value judgment on each one of them, as to which is the best one or which is better than the other. These mechanisms will develop as their legal culture evolves. In Chinese culture and tradition, litigation in courts was not considered positive. Dispute settlement in China always militated in favor of non-adversarial methods, because according to Confucius' teaching, in order to maintain social harmony, the optimal resolution of most disputes should be achieved not by the exercise of legal power, but by moral persuasion. Enforcement by outside force would only induce compliance in the external behavior of individuals, but it could not transform the inter inner character of members of the society. In modern times, although litigation courts is no longer regarded as negative to maintaining harmonious relations, it is still in most cases taken as the last resort for the dispute settlement. In international relations, China has invariably resorted to negotiations for settlement of disputes. Its lack of confidence and trust in the third party settlement can be attributed in my view to three factors. First of all, 
on matters that bear on national sovereignty and the territorial integrity. China firmly believes that the best way to handle a dispute is to conduct direct talks between the countries concerned, because the parties are in the best position to understand the historical background, the factual situation, and the overlapping claims of the parties. Whatever out of the negotiations is predictable, it is also believed that during the negotiations, both sides must take into consideration the positions of the other party and be ready to compromise. This calling for mutual understanding and mutual accommodation was long reflected in the ancient Chinese culture. For example, Confucian philosopher of the Lin, rituals, and the Ren, consenting <coughs> or yielding, to settle disputes through persuasion and concession. This attitude advocated by China has already proven effective and fruitful in resolving the land boundary dispute with its neighbors. Secondly, China's attitude towards the third party settlement also relates to its historical experience and the memory of the international as practiced by colonial powers against it in early days. Moreover, after 1949, for several decades, the People's Republic of China was not involved in the development of the international law. Politically and ideologically, it remains a skeptical about the impartiality and fairness of the third party mechanisms. The last factor is technical. So far, China has little experience with the third party settlement. Things are improving in the trade dispute settlement within WTO and commercial arbitrations, but not yet in the field of public international. With the ICJ, China has one limited experience that's in the Kosovo and the Union case. China, for the first time, appeared before the court to give its statement on the question presented by the General Assembly to the court. Cultural elements such as language, Knowledge of the legal culture of the international courts are not negligible factors for confidence building. Finally, I would like to briefly discuss the cultural element in the field of human rights with regard to China. I think that's a big chapter I, I uh, wrote in my head lecture for. On human rights, we have to make it clear at the beginning that. Uh, I make, uh, I have, we have made it clear at the beginning that there are certain international standards of fundamental human rights and freedoms that any nation, whatever culture and tradition it has, must observe. Any cultural di discourse cannot override such standards. In my head lecture, I started the chapter on human rights with the remark that as part of a social development, Human rights program, progress is a long process. Individual rights and freedoms cannot be substantiated without particular social conditions. Nor can they be taken out of a social context for examination. Human rights and the laws are the products of historical development. In hindsight, China has made tremendous progress in the social development, greatly improve the well-being of its people, including their civil and political rights, particularly in the past 35 years. <coughs> Internationally, there are basically three issues that hinder effective dialogues of human rights between China and the West. First, relationship between political system and human rights. Whether only a certain kind of a political system that can guarantee human rights. Secondly, relationship between civil and political rights and economic and social rights, whether there is a sequence or priority in human rights promotion. Thirdly, relationship between individual rights and collective social interests. How to common coordinate, common too. This is not a place to specifically deal with the human rights issues. But I wonder how many of you can tell what it really means for human rights 
by taking hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and provide them with food and a shelter. And uh, if I may add here, I read a book written by the former foreign minister of Singapore. He, at the beginning, he was uh, discussing about the social progress, and he compared China and India. At one point, he said, just think of how many people in the two countries who live in the house with a flush toilet. And what it means to people to have a flush toilet. And recently, I read in Financial Times a report about the Indian you know, movement to set up a public toilets. Uh, between the lines, I, I just feel that uh, the, 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 uh, the journalists did not really appreciate much the importance of this movement for a country like India, for a country like China. So this is really very subtle. Uh, there is cultural difference, and of course, more than uh, cultural elements. But when we read these kind of cases or recordings, we have to be more sensitive to their cultural aspect. On the social model of development, I would like to invoke a Chinese proverb which was derived from an ancient book in the spring and autumn period, the period from 770 to 470 BC. Yan's Chunqiu name Pian Zaxia. The story goes that in the southeast of, Asia, of China, there is a river called Huai River. The river still exists there. We know Huai a very big one. Peasants find that orange tree, trees on the southern bank of the river bear very sweet and tasty oranges. But if such trees were planted <coughs> on the northern bank of the river, they would bear a kind of fruit which would look like oranges, but taste bitter and the sour, which the peasants call zhi rather than ju. Rather than orange, they call them zhi. At first, the peasant could not understand it, could not understand the phenomenon, because the trees look the same. Their leaves and branches look the same. How come the fruits from the trees it's so differently. Finally, they discovered that because the water, soil, and climate on the northern bank are different from those on the southern side of the river, the fruits from the trees, as a result, change their flavor and taste. Okay, still looking the same. So there goes the proverb, Nan Beige. Literary translation. Southern orange, northern chip. Orange changes with the climate. This proverb, although over 2,000 years old, is still often in book in our daily life, teaching us that when introducing something new to a place, it's always important to see whether it fits into the local conditions. This is also true for human rights efforts. The Chinese tend to use the term Chinese characteristics to indicate that every policy must suit specific circumstances and the situations of the country. This is essential for such a huge country as China. In the past two decades, we have witnessed a number of democracy movements in the Middle East, Africa, and Eastern Europe. Some of them proved quite successful. Some were quite turbulent. One could observe that in many cases, a good model of democracy in one country, once introduced to another country, quickly changed its flavor. Instead of advancing democracy, it led to social chaos, corruption, and even armed conflicts. These are hard lessons. 
As the largest developing country, China will steadfastly continue to promote its human rights cause in line with its socio-economic development. Of course, it welcomes dialogues and exchange of views with other countries so that it can learn from outside. It's in our culture to be modest and always learn from others. As Confucius said, yeah. Uh, the, the literal meaning is even three people walking by you, you still can learn something from one of them. Uh, but uh, the, the real meaning is to be modest and always learn from others. In preparing this lecture, I have come across many recent writings on law and culture, or law as culture. General endorsement of cultural diversity within and across states manifests a changing world, a growing sense of interconnectivity as well as self-identity, either as a state, a people, an entity, or an individual. Cultural element from a blurring notion is gradually becoming of significant dimensions of international political studies. The direction of such studies should ultimately lead to more mutual understanding among and deeper respect for different cultures and peoples. Only on that basis can we proceed to meaningful global governance. I, I thank you for your patience and your patience to hear my stories. <laughs>